This is the Art of Darkness podcast with Kevin Kautzman and Brad Kelly. We're a couple of very online writers interested in the dark side of what drives creative people to create against all odds. This show is about art and the people who make it, what it costs them, and what it takes to bring something unique and impactful into the world. Each episode, we excavate the life and work of an artist you might think you know. Don't worry, they're all safely dead. On every episode, we try and find out just what the hell was wrong with them and how they worked through their darkness to create something that lives on after them and continues to move culture. Find us online at artofdarkpod.com and on Twitter at artofdarkpod. All right, we've got some sponsors for the pod now. Wait, what? Every link you need for the things we talk about here is at artofdarkpod.com slash sponsors. First up, books. If you're into this podcast... Odds are you're probably a reader. We've got links to buy new books from bookshop.org and used books from alibris.com. And if you want to listen to your books, we recommend and use audible.com. It's great and the catalog is huge. All right. So if you're listening to this, you are online. Maybe you're very online. You probably have a website or are thinking of starting one. Maybe you want a website like artofdarkpod.com. We built that with WordPress, which is by far the most popular way to create websites. And the single best host for serious WordPress is WP Engine. I've personally used them for over a decade now, and I don't host my websites anywhere else. Go to artofdarkpod.com slash sponsors and click on the WP Engine link to learn more. Finally, the best way to support the show is at patreon.com slash artofdarkpod. Get the bonus After Dark content for every episode, access to the book club, and more. Thanks for supporting Art of Darkness. And I, I don't think that was too painful. I think no, we did a pretty good job good. there. Yeah. Yeah, that sounded good. Yeah. Yeah, we appreciate it. It's my turn, Brad. Oh, boy. First <laughs> core episode. Well, I'll tell you. Today, Brad, you're going to get mauled. Oh, no. <laughs> Everybody is going to be mauled on this episode. I'm Kevin Couchman, joined by Brad Kelly. This is my first core episode of season three, 2023. Very excited about it. I think we've already we've already hit the ground running this year. We did some good stuff happening. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, the Conrad episode, people seem to really dig that. And we've had a couple of dark rooms that have been fun and interesting as always. So yeah, man, mm. we got uh, we've got some momentum. The wind is at our back. Let's do this uh, thing, right? No, no, there is no wind. It's perfectly oh. <laughs> uh temperate, 72 degrees, 24 7, 365. There is no <laughs> wind. There is only shopping. <laughs> that is all we have for you today because today's subject is a little different from Joseph Conrad. A little we're going outside of our our lane just slightly on this episode. We're going to cover our first architect. Hmm. Architects qualify. Yeah. Architects would tell you that they qualify. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yep. As creatives, as artists, and of course we're going to be covering Victor Grun. Uh, he was the troubled genius and theater kid oh. behind the American Mall. But I'm going to uh, leave it at that because I, okay. have to, I have to lead with Brad's with Brad's question. Yeah. Uh, so, Brad, what do you know about Victor Grun? Victor Grun was an architect <laughs> who designed the mall, invented the mall, and was a theater kid. Oh, wunderbar. Yeah. Oh, that, that's <laughs> another like that. thing about this. Yeah, my <laughs> like German that. is going to be tested to the max uh, on this episode. So I'm very excited Excellent. about that. Do not judge me that harshly. I do not yeah. practice uh, mein Deutsch uh, very often. Yeah, but not so, joking. I guess what I do know. Yeah, I do know that. I know I, he was born in another country. I'm going to assume Germany or a German speaking country based on what you said. Um, and... Yeah, he invented the mall in your neck of the woods, I believe, right? Minnesota. Well, and it's it's actually very curious. So this is the perfect subject for Art of Darkness because Groon uh, directly influenced both of our respective states, Brad yeah. in Michigan and our towns, mm. in fact. So Brad mm. in, in the greater Detroit area, and then mm. I'm in the greater Twin Cities uh, here mm. in Minnesota. Uh, we're going to get into that. So okay. there was kind of a one-two punch where he he created something called Northland, 
Do you know the Northland uh, mall? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. responsible for that. Interesting. Okay. And then he would go on and create Southdale over here in Edina, Minnesota. And that is considered the breakthrough, fully air conditioned, fully self contained indoor shopping mall. Because mm. Northland is kind of indoor outdoor, isn't it? Or maybe it was converted. I, you know, I couldn't even, I don't know that I've ever been there. I just know that oh. name. We have, you know, there's a sure. dozen shopping malls. So that wasn't my. Well, that mall. was. I yeah. understand that was an, yeah. ah, and now we're already getting into some of the motifs that, <laughs> that I want to be tackling on this episode because among architects and designers, Victor Grun is a household name. Mm. Uh, there's even something called the Grun effect, which we're going to talk about. Is but when among... your podcast gets a lot of listens, <laughs> that... yeah, specifically in <laughs> in Estonia or Austria, it's ah, called okay. the Grun effect. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hello to our Estonia listener listeners. Uh, yeah. Very interesting. Uh, so. No, the, the Grun effect. Well, you know what? I'll save it because I want to get into it. But he should be a name that everybody knows. There was a Malcolm Gladwell uh, article in the New Yorker some years ago that I'm going to lean on at one point during mm. this. That kind of bro- you know that will raise the the profile of anyone. But that was almost 20 years ago now, and I'm consistently surprised that more people aren't familiar with this fellow because when you when you think about people who have influenced your life right? Who lived Mm -hmm. in the 20th century. This guy has got to go on the extended Mount Rushmore or the the B side of Sergeant Pepper in our Mm -hmm. little imagination, right? Because you even just said just now, you're a mall. Mm -hmm. And you, you have all sorts of feelings. I mean, when you think about how many hours you as an American and even internationally have spent in malls or mall like environments, it didn't have to be that way. No, it not at all. Never needed to develop that way. And Victor Grun is the the Frankenstein behind the monster that is the mall. Oh, interesting. So, okay. Okay. Cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like this, man. Malls are these sites of modernity and alienation, but also community in a weird way. And a lot of us, especially in our generation, kind of grew up at, in malls to a certain degree. I don't know what it's like for, I don't know how Gen Z grew up, but uh, I know for us going to the mall was a big deal. Um, yeah. So this is, this is very interesting. These, the, these, the sort of the Walt Disney of this, this, particular aspect of american culture very interesting you mentioned disney because some of his later plans would influence epcot center Ah. so this this guy got around he did a lot uh and he he came to regret what happened to his creation and we're gonna we're gonna get there it's very complicated i'm very excited to be covering this little housekeeping first Please support the pod, patreon.com slash short of dark pod. Every episode gets a bonus mini episode we call After Dark, 20 to 30 minutes. And on the Victor Grun After Dark, I'm going to tell two stories. And then Brad and I will, you know, cut loose and sort of mm-hmm. figure out what, what the hell just happened on the on the main episode here. But I have a story of how one of Victor's friends impersonated a stormtrooper a Nazi stormtrooper and helped them escape Austria. Oh, wow. Very cool. Yeah. It helped, he helped them get their luggage. So we're going to go over that. That's quite fun. A little bit of a caper. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to tell the story of when Victor Grun met Einstein. Oh, did yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, the the, the right. thesis is intact, Brad. There are only 50,000 people alive <laughs> at a given time. <laughs> no, he didn't all meet each with- other. He didn't sleep with Annas Nin, did he? He did not okay. sleep with Annas Nin, <laughs> although he did have uh, four wives. And oh, get okay. Into it. Yeah. When probably, prepping, there is probably a six degrees of separation thing from Nin. Probably yeah. not, even, not even six <laughs> degrees. Yeah, Annas Nin. Uh, very good. So I'm excited. And then also, of course, if you want to follow along in the Telegram, which is our group chat, you can go to t.me slash Art of Dark Pod. We're almost, almost got about 100 people in there right now. It's really fun. We were talking mm-hmm. on the Dark Room episode we did yesterday with Monty uh, D. Montalegre. Like, very interesting. You think about what fellow fans or, or listeners of, of Art of Darkness are into, the chat reflects that. 
Yeah, you never know sure. what you're going to get. You yeah. might, you know, Stephanie Leahy is in there talking about medieval stuff. Uh, it's a good resource too if you have a question, if you're you're into something. You never know what you're going to stumble on in that chat. Yeah, no, so it's true. It, it has been fun the times where people have been like, "Hey, does anybody know about this?" And it's like mm. somebody in there knows something for usually. Right. So, very or at cool. least pretends to know. Right. Well, that's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah just like the pod. <laughs> yeah, right. uh, yeah. So again, please, Patreon, support the pod. We do two core episodes like this every month and we put in the work. Patreon.com slash Art of Dark Pod. And then, of course, Twitter.com slash Art of Dark Pod. And the final thing, final bit of housekeeping is YouTube. Even if you're not a big uh, YouTube person, get over there and subscribe booster numbers we're trying to get to i think a thousand subscribers so that we can you know whatever see a little bit of mo the yeah, money from yeah. the ads they're already running they're already running them so we might as well get a cut um yeah. and folks have been we have been had an uptick in subscribers there so if you're listening and you did that thank you very much we really do appreciate it rock and roll <clears throat> all right so let's get into it uh the two big books that i'm using as source material are victor Grun's own shopping town Oh. Uh, edited oh, and his translated. Book. Well, yes, edited yeah. and translated by Annette Baldauf, and it's called Shopping Town: Designing the City in Suburban America. I have a lot of opinions about this and about about this guy, and mm. I'm going to try to avoid editorializing too much. But we're going to have we're going to we're going to have a good sit down <laughs> with the the spirit of Victor Groom <laughs> yeah. and talk okay. about things like hubris. <laughs> and uh, best laid plans, mm. I think. And the audacity of somebody to come to the United States as a refugee and design our world mm. for cash. Oh boy. And then later and then later blame everybody else for it going wrong. I have some strong opinions actually. I, and I'm gonna, okay. anyway, book number two is Mall Maker, uh, Victor Grun, architect of an American dream by M. Jeffrey Hardwick. Hmm. Okay. So all right. Uh, I'm going to try to, I always try to be favorable to our subjects. And I've, I've struggled a little bit with this. <laughs> Give them the benefit of the doubt. You know. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Let's yeah. go in and get to know Victor Grun. Uh, one little bit of uh, of a note that's quite funny. So we we are not biographers. We are profilers. We do not write biography or create biography. Hmm. And, and now we lean on autobiography mm -hmm. we lean on biography mm -hmm. we lean on auto hagiography in the case <laughs> of mr crowley right he wrote mm -hmm. his auto i've got a new kind Ooh. of ography mm -hmm. it's an ergography according to victor grun from er the greek ergos what do you think that means air i don't like, i don't know ergonomic i think is related to it okay so like well ergonomic what does even even that ergo mean it's something about humans right i'll i'll tell you because there's no way <laughs> I, I don't i don't speak greek and no. uh in any case it means a record of his work oh so he's given us an ergography that's a little bit pretentious yeah. and furthermore it also it makes it a bit difficult to do an Art of Darkness episode because you're trying to pick the pieces together, particular, <laughs> particularly for a fellow who had four wives. Mm. You're trying to understand what exactly happened. I'm just going to say the the biography, the autobiography, the auto auto ergography or whatever that Grun has given us. Not the most uh, self reflective fellow. Not I, I, not. The most self-reflective. So sure, I'll sure. probably add a little bit of spice uh, as I go along. There are some moments where you go, well, what? <laughs> <laughs> wow, you really make yourself out to look like the, the hero, which I guess, go for it. But in any case, all right, let's get into it. The first thing I want to talk about before I get into the bio itself is the Grun effect, mm. uh, which... Brad, if you had to guess what the Grun effect is based on what you know so far, what would you what would you suspect it is? Um, I would suspect that the Grun effect has something to do with. Um, does uh, it makes me think of when you say it? It makes me think of the word Houstonization, which is an urban planner planning term, which is mm -hmm. basically um, 
the, in Houston, there's no, and I might be getting this wrong. This is sort of, uh, this is sort of like lore that I I've heard it in the engineering world. Um, that in Houston, they had no, um, they had no districts. So it wasn't like, here's an industrial, this is zoned industrial, this is zoned residential. So it's just a free for all. And then what you get is Houston when you do that. Maybe that's good. Maybe that's bad. People who come from, from out of town can find it a little disorienting because it's it like, is there's pretty a, jarring. Yeah. There's a chemical yeah. plant and then a pizza house place and then an apartment building and like, then a daycare right. and then a bank. Yeah. Right. It's, it's quite overwhelming for somebody. It, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I guess the Grun effect makes me think of that though. It's not exactly that. So right. Something about no. you make one decision and it affects, it has broad effects. On yeah. How it happens. Okay, well, I'm going to read, this is in Victor Grun's own words, so a little background. This is from 1948. It is our belief that there is much need for actual shopping centers, marketplaces that are also centers of community and cultural activity. We are convinced that the real shopping center will be the most profitable type of chain store location yet developed, and the simple reason that it will include, uh, for the simple re- reason that it will include features to induce people to drive considerable distances to enjoy its advantages. Mm. Shopping as destination. Mm. He would later turn vehemently against the car. Uh, all right. Yeah. Which so here's he's, a, oh okay. So so yeah, I'm not wrong in direction, but that's very interesting because the shopping mall yes. is one of these half a dozen things that made us a car culture right yeah. indeed uh a major one mm-hmm. i would say mm-hmm. so here we go uh in 1997 the university of minnesota go gophers hosted a conference to figure out that ubiquitous american institution the mall the location was significant since america's first enclosed mall had opened its doors in nearby adina 41 years earlier Participants took an officially sponsored field trip to ponder Club Snoopy and Legoland at the Mall of America. They looked upon the apotheosis of American consumerism. They agreed on little. Journalists, architects, historians, and sociologists saw different cultural meanings in the 5.2 million square foot mall. Grandiose or monstrous, liberating or oppressive, entertaining or stupefying. The thinkers could not settle on a simple answer. The panelists offered diverse and often opposing views about America's immense shopping palace. Did it really mean anything to Americans? Or was it just one more place to shop? Had the mall compromised the essence of democracy, people gathering together and voicing their concerns? Or had it merely redefined public space and personal expression as shopping? And perhaps was there an unrealized potential, uh, potential for political or economic mobilization at the mall? Was it the cause or a symptom of Americans' love affair with consumption? The conference participants often contradicted each other. They presented searing critiques about the significance of fountains, ficus trees, parking lots, suburban life, food courts, and shopping itself. One theologian saw a shopping trip to the mall as akin to a medieval pilgrimage. A European architect celebrated America's commercial frenzy as the triumph of incongruity and complexity. In the end, they agreed on only one thing, the disturbing prevalence of a major retail theory. Dubbed the Grun transfer or Grun effect, the theory holds that shoppers will be so bedazzled by a store's surroundings that they will be drawn unconsciously, continually to shop. The experts pointed to this theory as explaining mall shopping's powerful and pernicious hold on America's collective psyche. Journalists covering the conference latched onto this unity of opinion. Reporters began their stories by unveiling the Grun effect as if by exposing it to light, the theory perhaps would evaporate. The reporters, like the panelists, took comfort in the notion that one theory might explain why Americans consume so much and enjoy consuming. I'll go on just a little bit here. One Minneapolis journalist breathlessly revealed the inner workings of the theory to his readers. In fact, you've already been grunized repeatedly and probably don't know it. He summarized how architects strategically manipulate the public with trees, lights, fountains, and colors to make them mindlessly purchase more goods. 
Mall design is all about the removal of those impediments to the consumer impulse, he explained. The displays are everywhere. The air is dry and clogging. The credit card is in your hand as you march like a POW toward the next display of goodies. The entire shopping mall experience was as if the guards won't let you stop, even for a moment, the process of having fun. <laughs> like that oh yeah. goodness yeah yeah mm. that sounds about yeah. right that's the groon effect, the groon effect a little bit yeah all right so let's arrive at uh the background and the career of the fellow who did this um victor david grunbaum was born on july 18th of 1903 in a middle class really upper middle class jewish family in vienna austria his father was a lawyer with many clients in the arts, and they had a special interest in the theater. Victor Grun, as I said, was a theater kid and not a dabbler mm. at all. I'll mm. get to it. Mm. They had a group. He was a, he was also a socialist. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> a socialist theater kid <laughs> from Vienna invented the mall. Let's just <laughs> pause and savor the delicious irony of this, shall we? Yeah. Yeah. What a joy. We'll get to it. Um, now, Victor Grun, by his own, in his own words, and, and first I'm going to read from Mallmaker and then his uh, auto egography or whatever it is. Um, <laughs> it, was, uh, it was a pretty idyllic childhood up to a point. Mm. Um, so I think I have some uh, about this. Let's see here. I want to make sure I get the right. Well, so Vienna is an interesting place to be from, too. Right? Oh, for sure. And yeah. during this period, right? Again, mm -hmm. the year is born in 1903 in Vienna. So we know what's coming in yes. short order. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Grun had loved life in Vienna. Quoting, I never really left Vienna. It was a haven, he later remembered. For 35 years, he had lived in the vibrant Austrian city on the da uh, Danube, enjoying uh, successes in theater and architecture, an active political life, and a rich social life, all of which we'll get um, get to. Victor Grunbaum was born in 1903, the only son of a typical Viennese liberal family. And, and when they say liberal, that meant a lot. That's not mm. like liberal now. That's mm. liberal in 1903 in Vienna, which mm -hmm. means socialism. It means anti anti racism in a really early sense. Mm, uh, it means right. divorces can happen. Uh, it just it means an awful lot. It means, um, well, frankly, uh, rootless cosmopolitanism, super mm. cosmopolitan uh, people, and who like identify with this. Mm. People who and it, it, in this class of person have help, so they can go out and do the town even with young children at home that kind of liberalism and then politically as well mm -hmm. um so he was the only son of a typical viennese liberal family with a well-staffed household so middle class i don't know that yeah. if you got staff i don't know uh his father worked as a lawyer for theatrical clients adolf grunbaum the unfortunately named adolf grunbaum mm -hmm. Uh, also had a bit of the showman in him and was a popular lecturer in Viennese social clubs. The Grunbaum family lived in Vienna's Central District 1 in the heart of old Vienna. Turn of the century, Vienna was the birthplace of modernism. The city was famous for the art of Gustav Klimt and Oskar Kokoschka, the music of Gustav Mahler and Arnold Schoenberg. Modern psycho, uh, psychoanalysis with Sigmund Freud, Wilhelm Reich, and the younger Eric Erikson had been developed in Vienna. The group of writers known as Young Vienna, including including Arthur Schnitzler, the author of uh, Traum Novell behind Eyes Wide Shut, mm -hmm. Stefan Zweig, and Robert Musel, also explored the mores of middle class Vienna. In architecture, modernists like Josef Hoffmann, Adolf Luce, very popular name, Adolf Luce, yeah. and Otto uh, Wagner revolutionized the design of houses, stores, and public buildings. Uh, in Vienna by combining sleek ornamentation and modern materials. At the craft guild and retail store, Wiener Werkstatt, uh, yeah, modernists also designed a new kind of decorative arts. Grun grew up in the dying embers of this vibrant aesthetic life. One thing I want to flag 
as I'm reading here and as we're going is that Groon is such a great symbol or a, yeah, can, his life can symbolize 19th century idealism crashing headlong into 20th century reality. Mm-hmm. Let's notice that as we go along, his own trajectory will follow this because his family will have some serious problems as we go here. He will eventually flee mm-hmm. and then he will he will do his best to recreate an idyllic space in a place he does not understand right. namely namely suburban minnesota <laughs> <laughs> that's not that's not this that's not vienna turn of the century vienna no it is not no. neither is detroit <laughs> no <laughs> and the, again a great deal of hubris and an extraordinary amount of condescension and uh grandiose ideas yeah very grandiose ideas uh and we'll get to it yeah i mean he sounds like he's a sort of a social engineer kind of person a a little bit yeah if if we make the building here the the little american people will go into this Mm -hmm. and but you know and i don't want to be too harsh on him because he he was very well intentioned and we will get to it there's a lot of nuance around this i really want to avoid saying oh he came to live to regret his creation it's it's Mm -hmm. a little more complex than that so we're going to trouble that story a little bit um Yeah, so he grew up in the dying embers of this vibrant aesthetic life. By the time he was a young man, Viennese citizens had turned toward more political activities, though a new generation did continue to invent new aesthetic forms to better people's lives. In the midst of coffee houses, theaters, restaurants, stores, hotels, and apartments, Grun believed he was living in Europe's center of intellectual and cultural life. All right, so I want to get to a little more about his, uh, his childhood What a, it just, it's so staggering to think about somebody who's born in Vienna in 1903 (laughs) and would Mm -hmm. live to see, I think he makes it to the eighties. I mean, just what a, what a world, man. And those, uh, those wars are coming in this biography. (laughs) And so, um, yeah, here's a little bit in his own words from his childhood. Uh, let's see here. This is the first time I'm going to read from his autobiography. Um, Mm -hmm. This is chapter two. He starts the first chapter. He starts with their escape, but then he goes back into his childhood. Uh, Memories are inevitably a mix of of what one has experienced oneself and what one has heard so much about from others that one gradually comes to believe that one has experienced it as well. Uh, That's an interesting way to start. What's real anyway? (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yeah. These are, these are my memories. They're, they're mine. (laughs) They may not be objectively true, but I am a a very important architect. Right. A little red book titled Unsa Kint that I have had for many years tells me that I was born on July. It means our our child, our our Mm -hmm. son. On July 18th, 1903 at 3.20 in the morning, a very inopportune hour for all involved, and that I received loving attention as a firstborn child. Also in this little red book, I find notes on my first funny ideas, attempts at walking, and early travels. My father, Dr. Adolf Grunbaum, was born in Vienna, the son of a miller from Lundenburg. My mother, Ellie, Elizabeth Leah Levy, was about 15 years younger than my father. The birth of my sister, Louise, 18 months after mine, is mentioned in the Little Red Book as well. She was presented to me with the words, This is your sister. At that time, my language skills were not overwhelming. All I said was, Ischl. I used the same diminutive for my sister until our teenage years. The apartment where we were born was at Mark Arel Strasse uh, 3 in the 1st District. The children's room was next to my father's uh, law office. He tried to protect himself from our noise by placing a mattress against the double doors between the two rooms. When I was, so maybe a little middle class-ish mm-hmm. there. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Um, can relate. When I was about five years old, we moved to the second floor of a just completed apartment building at Rimergasse 9, where I was to spend the next 30 years of my life. The house was next to the new district court, and it was designed specifically for lawyers. Our unit had two main entrance doors. 
One led through a small vis- uh, vestibule to the KUK Hof und Gericks Advokaturs Kanzlei of my father. I think it just means the law office. Woo! <laughs> Gerichts Advokuta Kanzlei. Okay, I think I did okay. Yeah, it looks That's like rough. something floating in the background now. <laughs> a little <laughs> magic trick, something. I think. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> gracious. Um, the other two are apartments. So it, it's an office. That, it's a house that serves as an office and uh, and living quarters for a lawyer. Mm. Uh, the apartment consisted of a nursery that also served as a living room, a master bedroom, and a large corner room that was reserved as a salon for guests and parties. The apartment had the most up-to-date modern conveniences. It had a hall, a pantry, a tiny balcony, a bathroom with cold running water and a gas water heater, which was used once a week, and a toilet. Electric lighting was provided for each room. Since one could not one could not quite yet trust this invention, there were also gas lighting fixtures, so-called hour stockings. Years later, a descendant of the Austrian inventor Auer became my partner in America. Um, he was wildly successful as an architect. Like mm-hmm. put everything else, uh, uh, you know, aside that yeah. I said. I mean, we'll see. He was hugely successful. Yeah. There's very interesting, and you're reading this. He's very conscious in it of, like, if I were to describe the house I grew up in, this is not how I would describe it. There was a this and a that, and this need was met with this thing. It's very like, yeah, it, yeah, it sounds like a 100%. guy who would design a building, right? Yeah, mega shape rotator mm-hmm. on the scene. Yeah. Not so much, although he was, he would write terrible poetry, but um, <laughs> more of a, a shape rotation. Ah, who hasn't? Uh, who hasn't? The tiny chamber where the cook and the maid slept had neither of these two advanced types of lighting. This was typical. It was assumed that service personnel had to content themselves with candles or kerosene lamps. Wear the mask. <laughs> uh, nothing changes. One of the three offices was equipped with a large library and had a dual purpose. During the day, it was my father's study. In the evening, when we had guests, it was where the men smoked, drank, and talked politics, while the ladies in the salon continued their conversations about housewives' duties or fashions. Although this may not seem very logical, I considered my childhood as those years before 1918, when my father died. I regard this era as a discrete period during which I lived in unclouded happiness with loving parents who nurtured and cared for me. I lived unworried by anything until the war years. So uh, he had a uh, quite a quite an idyllic childhood. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's there's more here I want to get into. And then we will eventually come over to the his father's um, passing. Um What a perfect life of the aspiring middle class my parents led in that time before the outbreak of World War I, with an exclamation point, a rare exclamation point, a perfect life. Mm. My father was a gifted, again, idealism. He's got this idyllic memory. My father was a gifted musical man who knew how to connect his career as a lawyer with his love for the arts, especially for the theater. His clients consisted mostly of friends and people he valued highly. He was not only the legal representative of a famous Viennese operetta theater, the Karlstheater, but also an attorney for many composers, actors, and comedians. Mm -hmm. Among these clients were the composers Franz Lehar and Emmerich Kalman, the violinist Fritz Kreisler, and actors such as Karl Treumann and Mitzi Zverenz. A Jewish entertainment lawyer. Mm -hmm. I mean... Mm -hmm. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. Uh, the famous cabaret artist Fritz Grunbaum, to whom we were not related, uh, was both a friend and a client of my father. Uh, and I wonder how much of this would be like almost like an agent as well. Like, I, I wonder if the solicitor or the lawyer at the mm-hmm. time also doubled as that. It's, it could uh, could very well be. I mean, the, the boundaries are kind of blurry now, even, I think. Not that I have a showbiz lawyer, but um, <laughs> but yeah. Not yet, Brad. Right. Well, come right. on. Dan Bolton. <laughs> Lawyer of the show. <laughs> he's on He's on speed dial, buddy. He's waiting. Uh, we were a typical Viennese family of the higher middle class. My father's family came from Moravia, and the Jewish patriarch of my mother's family came from Hamburg. Initially, Mama had some problems with the Viennese dialect. Uh, as a North German, she stumbled over a sharp stone and could barely adjust herself to the, to the Viennese pronunciation of Sh-p and sh-t 
I don't know how to do that. When shopping for groceries on the Nashmark or in the wholesale market, my parents had to rely on the language skills of our faithful cook, Tony, since their requests for oranges, cauliflower, and tomatoes from the market uh, women were met with incomprehension. Hmm. This would come back in Groon's life too, because when he came to America, he had very little ingu- English oh. and he had to busy himself learning. Supported by a cook, a maid, a cleaning woman for the tougher work in the home, and a nanny, and a tutor for the education of her children, my mother lived the life of an elegant lady. My father's large circle of friends and acquaintances soon turned her into a real veneran. Um, yeah, so this could go on and on. Uh, let's read a little bit about his father's um, politics. Well, this is interesting because this is about their their religion. Um, one moment. Mm-hmm. Our religious education stressed altruism and faith in God, but not in the specific God of one religion. Every night we said two prayers. I'm small, my heart is pure, no one dwells in it but God alone. And Mm -hmm. I'm tired, go to sleep, close my eyes, Father, let your eyes be on my bed. Otherwise, we celebrated the usual Catholic feasts and looked forward to a wonderful Christmas tree and many presents. At Easter, we held an Easter egg hunt. We had a passion for eating Jewish matzah, but we put ham on it. <laughs> so <laughs> mixed up family. Uh, yeah, interesting. Yeah. Once or twice. And I, you know, I want to get in because I'm, let me just see here. One moment. Yeah, this is such a very interesting story. I mean, and that's what I mean by liberal, kind of right. secular liberal. Like yeah. we believe in God, we'll do the Catholic holidays. Yeah, let's have some matzo balls, but ham, that's fine. Yeah, throw a piece we of ham on there. Yeah. We don't believe in the old superstitions or whatever it is. Um, once or twice, my father insisted that we celebrate Passover uh, when he felt that the story of the liberation of the Jews from Egyptian slavery should be part of our education. I visited the beautiful Jewish temple in Seiten's Stettengasse, designed by the Victorian architect Josef Kornhausel, only a few times, usually on the occasion of a wedding. Because of the liberal lifestyle of my parents, who socialized with people from all faiths, as a child, I was rarely uh, rarely aware of my own Judaism. One exception was in some of the of my interactions with our cook, Tony. She was a very devout Catholic, the one true faith who went to church each day at dawn. Facing an unspecified youthful folly, she was trying to find heavenly salvation by proselytizing me, a Jewish child. She scared and confused me with stories about the horrible torture of Jesus Christ by the wicked Jews. As a result, I concluded my evening prayer with an additional sentence. Dear God, you who are always also the God of the Catholics, Protestants, Jews, and Muslims, please watch out and protect me so that nothing but nothing happens. (laughs) <laughs> he's like i didn't kill i didn't kill jesus <laughs> right right it's a, li- it's a little kid that is really interested in fixtures and sconces <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> politically my father was undoubtedly a liberal but he was also an ardent austria hungry patriot in 1914 my parents were upset about the assassination of the archduke franz ferdinand in sarajevo At the age of 11, I went with my father to the newly established War Department and tested my knowledge of Latin reading the motto that adorns the facade of the building. Si vis pacum para bellum. If you want peace, prepare for war. Mm -hmm. It's still metal. (laughs) Then came the historic moment in which Serbia rejected the Austrian ultimatum and Austria declared war. And people shouted, long live Austria. Serbia must die. And we were shouting enthusiastically along with everybody else. Yeah. 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 Not so, yeah. Not so uh, liberal now. Right. Isn't that funny? Yeah. 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 Nothing changes, man. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. What is, and I suppose what is, what what is that? Yeah. What does that mean? Well, let's go. Mm. When the war broke out, the comfortable lifestyle of my parents abruptly ended and of all the core episodes we've done i can't think of a case of somebody who had a more tony and cushy childhood only to have it kind of hit the shores of some real tough stuff and you have to admire groon for his fortitude through all of this both as a young man but also when the second war would come 
Oh, yeah. I mean, this I, guy got this guy got wrecked by both by both. Yeah. Of them. Yeah. He's yeah. interesting. He's of an interesting age too, right? Too young to serve in World War One, kind of too young, too old to serve in World War Two, but still kind of uh, a of youngish the, man. Right. The mm-hmm. right age for it all to be like centerpiece of his life. And yeah. Yeah. And there's and they escape by the skin of their teeth. So mm-hmm. there's only one other thing that could have happened to him uh, mm-hmm. short of escaping. And it's not pleasant. Uh, from our nursery window, we often watched our father give his speeches just opposite our apartment in the courtroom of the Vienna Commercial Court. Uh, and he has a parenthetical here. It's the same courtroom where I would in 1967 face charges of working as an architect without proper credentials. <laughs> because it's very, very serious to call yourself an architect, apparently. Mm-hmm. I assume anywhere, but particularly in Austria. Mm-hmm. Um, and the way that would work out later in his life is like he I mean, he had gone to the United States. He had invented the ball and practiced architecture and had hundreds and hundreds of employees and was like an architect. But mm-hmm. because I think because of some of the turmoil or whatever, he had never really finished his formal examination in Austria. Oh. So it's just this real kind of butthurt, weird <laughs> kind of event and they they allowed him to call himself an architect but like with the english spelling or something not architect with the right, more metal right. the more right. metal k yeah <laughs> that's a little bit of a uh, what's to come yeah okay uh after lunch father regularly went to the nearby cafe de la ropa on stefan's plots to maintain his so- uh, society relations On the few occasions when he took me along, I discovered that he often played tarot or billiards. When he returned from the cafe, he completed correspondence or visited uh, clients. Kind of like an email job, like a social email job. Yeah. Mm. I proudly accompanied this elegant gentleman, stiff black hat, collar, and walking stick to meetings in the Karl uh, Theater. While father was negotiating with director Sigmund Eibenschutz, I sat in the darkened auditorium and excitedly watched rehearsals of then popular operettas such as Der Rastelbinder und, und Ein Walzer Traum. A dream of a waltz, waltzing hmm. person, I think. <sighs> Undoubtedly, this is when my interest in theater awoke. And I, after this, I really hope, Brad, you and our listeners, people who hear this, <laughs> never look at them all the same way. Mm, the mm-hmm. mall is a stage mm-hmm. the mall is a theater 100 yeah. uh, percent. i just think it's so interesting i was introduced to famous artists i once ca- uh, caused great laughter when i got a kiss from the very young soubrette mitzi zarens and cried i will not be kissed by an old lady <laughs> my love for the theater was enhanced by visits to the opera the berg theater and the volks theater During the day, the maid or nanny usually supervised us children. Every day, we took the short, safe walk along the wide Ringstrasse to the playground in the city park. We had so much more fun and many more friends in this park than did my own children in the isolated, well-manicured gardens and swimming pools of L.A. many years later. Before falling asleep, my sister and I always played impromptu theater scenes with assigned roles. I was a designer and seller of lighting fixtures. See, just really into <laughs> fixtures. It's adorable. It's sort of yeah, cute. Yeah. It yeah. is kind of cute. What a nerdy, very nerdy thing. <laughs> Weaponize your autism. Right. <laughs> Change the world. Right. Let's go. <laughs> and Ishel was a customer with extravagant desires. Right. I described to her the most fantastic chandeliers, but she would always criticize them and want something different. After our parents left us with our goodnight kisses, they went dran, as it was called back then, a word derived from the rotation of a waltz. They went out, mm. they went out bar hopping. Yeah, partying. Yeah. Yeah, partying. Yeah. This meant that they were out with friends enjoying the nightlife of Vienna to the fullest, theater concerts, and afterward a restaurant, cafe, or wine ba- bar. I want to keep on because he, he paints such a thorough picture of his childhood. I, I think this is helpful. Uh, are you following along, Brad? Yeah, well, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. cool. Um, on Sundays and holidays in the warm months, we hiked with our father, who was an avid mountain climber in the environs of Vienna. In the cold season, we vis- uh, excuse me, we visited the family Lemberger, with whom my parents were the closest friends. The adults would go out while we five children, Poldy, Hetty, 
and Vali Lemberger and my sister and I spent afternoons together. <laughs> this is fun. With assigned rules, we often played state. We made money from slips of paper. Poldy was a theater director. Hetty was the owner of a magazine store. I published a newspaper, which was sold by Hetty, and Luis and Valley took varying tasks. So-called tea was served. This was hot water sprinkled over chocolate powder. We then drank it with an old spoon that had a hole in it so that the chocolate tea was able to run forever. Lovely. It says, for my 70th birthday, I received a replica of this perforated spoon from Hetty. Which is Aww. quite funny. That's, that's a funny. hell of a memory. Yeah, right? Yeah, my goodness. Huh. Yeah. Uh, later, we would all think back on this game from our childhood, especially since we were all scattered throughout various states of the world. Uh, to the dis dismay of her Jewish father, Valley married the Goy, non-Jew Willie Steiner in New York. And it goes on talking about uh, all the various people they married and where they ended up. But they stayed, they must have stayed very close throughout like the war and uh, yeah. being, becoming <clears throat> refugees. One more that's little a, bit about it's a yeah. real challenge, right? I mean, because you get become a refugee, you're not thinking about, oh, I got to make sure everybody's got my new address and they've bought it'd be a challenge after I think like that to make I sure think under don't. the circumstances, you have this this intense uh, Judaism in play, this ethnic bond that they share. And then also like the pro like almost the worst possible thing that mm -hmm. could have happened happened. So I could imagine you'd make an extra effort mm -hmm. to stay in touch. I yeah. think we also now these days kind of take it for granted. Like, ah, I can always find him on Facebook. Right. You figure you can right. kind of find anybody. And it's like, right. have you tried? Right. <laughs> Not always so. That's right. Um, one more little bit here. Um, oh, what's funny is uh, uh, Poldy, the child, the theater director in our children's game, later became the great director, Leopold Lindbergh. So actually oh. became a director, which is kind of fun. Huh. Um. Part of our annual program. So this is the kind of family he's from. Yeah. Part of our annual program. These are people who <laughs> summer. Yeah. <Right. laughs> was a summer trip to my mother's relatives in Germany. We mm. were cost conscious traveling third class, but also class conscious wearing white gloves. <laughs> I'm glad I got that detail in because that yeah. is quite a good summary of the, yeah. the family's affectation. Mm. Um. Our trains usually went to Berlin, then to Hamburg, then to Euten in Schleswig-Holstein, and finally to the North Sea. It's quite a trip. Mm. In Berlin, we visited a cousin of my mother from the Fair family. Selmar Fair was general manager of Deutsche Bank. Mm. I was deeply impressed by the elegance. Now, this is upper class. By the elegance of the Fair family lifestyle, which included a driver and many servants. Of their three children, the only one I met later was Rudy, who became the black sheep of the family when he ran off early to L.A. because he was more interested in jazz than in banknotes. <laughs> when he became a production manager for the Warner Brothers Film Company, the prodigal son proved to be the family's savior. Uh, so that's a bit of a side note. Yeah, it's quite, kind of fun. So it goes on, but that's the that's the kind of childhood that he's having. They're moving around. They're taking trips. He doesn't seem to have a care in the world. It doesn't sound like his dad's a drunk or his mom's neurotic. If if they are, it's it, not that so much of a problem that he he cares to mention it. So right, of right. the child uh, the the childhoods we've covered, um, you know, I really don't think that uh, yeah, this one's pretty cush, pretty cush. Yeah. So. Yeah, I talked about the liberalism. Now we got to get to we got to get to the war mm. um, and his father's death. Uh, so let's see here. I want to make sure that I. Uh, yeah. So let's see. When he war broke out, he was what? Uh, he was born in 1903. So he uh, would have been. Twelve. Yeah. Yeah. Around I there. mean, yeah. Well, let's get it. Let's get it. Uh, get it exact. Yeah. Uh, in 1914, so he would have been 11. 11, yeah, yeah, 11. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, heavy, heavy change. Um, and let's get into it. The outbreak of World War One darkened our lives. New restrictions brought limitations to our standard of living. For us children, the most emotional change was the loss of our holiday trips to northern Germany. Nevertheless, there were still vacations though now at places closer to home, such as Seeboden, Aresee, Edlach on the Rocks, and Weidling-Würzbachtel on der Stadtbahn. Oof. 
Our parents grew worried by reports of the war. My father put all his money into war bonds. Ooh. Betting on Austria. Yeah. That's uh, okay. It's a bold move. Yeah. (laughs) Whenever somebody puts all their money on one thing. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) My mother often went to the Hotel Imperial where society ladies knitted socks and caps, prepared Sharpie for wound dressings, and rolled cigarettes for the soldiers at the front. I wrote patriotic poems with titles like Hooray, Hooray for the Fatherland and We Need and Want to Win. (laughs) (laughs) Outstanding. Ausgezeichnet. Yeah, Yeah, (laughs) wunderbar. (laughs) <laughs> which were printed in the local paper. Well, yeah, I mean, he's a yeah. little boy. Yeah. Yeah. Father wrote a play called In the Trenches, which we staged during a family stay in Seaboden am Atasse at the Hauptel Inn. I played the role of an Austrian soldier. Once, father traveled to Hungary and brought back a piece of bread from that former part of the monarchy, which had obviously never suffered from a lack of food. We cut it ceremoniously like a cake and enjoyed the simple bun as a delicacy. So they've gone hmm. from yeah. haves to have nots a bit here. Yeah. In 1916, from the windows of the office of Mr. Lemberger on Rotenturmstrasse, we watched the funeral parade of Emperor Franz Josef I. I was particularly moved by the a little blonde boy who marched obediently behind the coffin. It was Crown Prince Otto Habsburg walking between Emperor Karl and Empress Zita. At the end of the war, in the summer of 1918, the Spanish flu was rampant in Vienna, and among the victims were the painters Gustav Klimt and Egon Schiele. Poor nutrition in recent years had also severely weakened my father's health, so he had little resistance against the flu. He had also probably poisoned himself with the foul Glimstingeln he had smoked for so long instead of his beloved Virginia cigars. He died at the age of 59. Hmm. So World War I has come. The family uh, is, you know, like bread is a delicacy. Mm. And now his father drops dead Jeez. at the age of 59, which is pretty young. That's really? Not a, yeah. Yeah. That's not a good. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, you, you kind of hope to live longer than 59, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. All right. Here's little Victor or Victor recounting little Victor's reaction. They tried to force me to look at him in the coffin, but I refused. I wanted to keep him in my mind as he was when I last saw him, reading a book by Turgenev. After a routine funeral, which could not ease my pain, I did a pencil portrait of my father from a photograph and my memories. Collapse. With the death of my father in 1918, my childhood was finally over. But the entire political and social structure of in Central and Eastern Europe had also collapsed. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Just like that reminds me. Like I went through a little bit of a breakup, like around nine eleven. That was really funny. You're going through a breakup, and then this happening. Like, wait, I don't know what what to care about right now. It is. It's very very confusing. (laughs) Yeah. Well, Brad, I, I got to step up to use the. I got to use the bathroom real quick. Tell me though, where are you at with Gr- Victor Gruen? Sixty seconds. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, this is really interesting. This context he's coming out of. Of course, I don't know any. I didn't know he was out of Vienna. So you're mentioning uh, Klimt and Schilla, who are artists that I quite like. Um, and of course, we've covered a lot of subjects who, um, you know, had to deal with World War One in a sort of biographical way. So, so that that aspect isn't surprising. But yeah, this steep drop off in his life in 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 is very interesting. It makes you think that he's probably reflecting back on it. I don't think that he's saying anything um, dishonest. But you wonder if he would have painted it in quite such rosy colors had it never sort of ended right we have this tendency to kind of look back on on, on better days and everything sort was of better ideal. before the war right yeah right right, right. Mm. so it's very interesting but, i mean at the same time like objectively can you imagine being from a well-heeled family in vienna circa yeah. 1908 you got money right. to throw around you've got servants you're right. in like one of the cultural capitals of the west right and then and all of a sudden, it's it's uh it's yeah you're cutting gone. up a bun for a bun for for dessert. 
Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So I've got more. Mm -hmm. The vacuum created by this collapse of the central powers, the German Empire, Austria-Hungary, and their smaller allies, unleashed a storm that shook all the structures of the past. The multinational state, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, burst into an independent small states. The hurricane swept away symbols of social order as if they were withered leaves. Emperors, kings, and czars, the nobility and dashing officers of the military were all blown away. The mm. proud double eagle was gone from our flag. Regimes, democracies, council republics, and military dictatorships rose and fell through civil wars, coups, and revolutions. The ideal world of the 19th century was now thought to have been hypocritical. Uh, Vienna, once a proud metropolis of the monarchy, became the capital of a torso state. Its street... Uh, streets and squares were flooded with the ragged figures of disintegrated, defeated armies. Wounded soldiers and returning prisoners mingled with civilians who were suffering from hunger and deprivation. Then there were those vultures who took advantage of every misery, speculators, profiteers, political adventurers. In Austria, there was no bloody revolution. The changes took place under the dictatorship of the victorious powers. Uh, on November 12th of 1918, when the Republic was proclaimed, I was wedged into a crowd in front of the Parliament building. Two red, white, red flags of the Republic were meant to be hoisted, but protesters had cut out the white center sections of the flags as a way of calling into question the, the, the form of this new government and the social order itself. Because of this sort of questioning, the new Republic never found peace between the wars. In this era of turmoil and uncertainty, at the age of 15, I took on the role of head of the family. Oh, they grew up fast back then. Yeah. And yeah. This, this young man had to. Uh, our financial situation <laughs> was bleak. My father's considerable savings, about 200,000 crowns, which <laughs> I don't know what that translates to, but I suspect it's a lot. Mm. had been invested in war bonds and had become worthless overnight. Oh, no. Wrecked! <laughs> yeah, that's that's not good. That's... Yep. Uh, Bet on the wrong team. Yeah, for sure. Oof. For some years... And he's dead now. Yeah. So yeah. his earning power is gone. Mm -hmm. For some years, we counted on revenues from his law firm, which had been taken over by one of his former clerks. We clung to another glimmer of hope. My father had entrusted his allegedly wealthy friend, the architect Edmund Melker, with our guardianship. Financially, he could not help us, but he was willing to employ me at his company if I attended a four-year college. We made okay. the following decisions. I would finish the fourth grade of grammar school, and then uh, I think that would mean... Well, in any case, the fourth grade of grammar school and then attend the higher state vocational school department of building construction in autumn of 1919. So he's turning 16. So I think we're talking about high school. Yeah. My sister went to a school for sewing and needlework. The house staff was immediately dismissed and the office premises were sub subleased to Dr. Muller, as were the salon and the servants rooms. The changes were most painful for my mother. You know who this is reminding me of is a little bit is Kafka. Yeah. Suddenly yeah. I'm the man of the house. I got to go and earn because if I don't, my family is on the street. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 His oh. mother went from being a spoiled society lady to a careworn housewife. The food situation deteriorated steadily. With a hand cart, we moved from freight stations to charitable dispensaries only to find half rotten potatoes, turnips, and dried herrings. Mm -hmm. We often ate in public kitchens. So they went from <laughs> what they had to food stamps. Right. Like right. And food kitchens. Yeah. The first post-war winter was the worst. We collected paper, wood chips, and waste in the streets, trying to find enough to heat two ovens, one for our tenant and the other a small iron stove ca called House Friend in the room where we lived all together. There was mm -hmm. no money for the tram. Even long trips to my sister's school in the 8th District had to be made on foot. Later, we children got cocoa and canned evaporated milk from an American relief operation. Slowly, we got used to everything. An innate optimism helped my mother to forget her pain as she constantly toiled in an admirable way to master all our difficulties. After a few years, my sister established herself as a dressmaker and was very busy. 
I alone had misgivings about my future. The decision to attend a technical school in order to be hired later in a builder's business saved me from the agony of choice that young people often, uh, my age, often generally faced. On the other hand, it hardly seemed an inviting prospect. My chances of becoming a draftsman, structural engineer, or even a master builder seemed slight. With this plan, I thought I would not get one inch closer of my goal of becoming an architect. Hmm. He wanted to be an architect from a pretty young age. Yeah, uh, there's yeah. an anecdote in one of these books about that where he he first got exposed to the idea, I think in like a drawing class, and his teacher had said you could be an architect, and Gruen's like, "What's that?" It's like there's yeah. a person who makes buildings, and Victor Gruen's like, "Oh, the fixtures are all in the buildings." <laughs> uh, I can I, I pick maybe can I, I pick the doorknobs? I can pick the yeah, light right, switch, the switch right. plates. Yeah. I <laughs> <laughs> I skipped over uh he did spend some time in the in the Boy Scouts. Mm. Um I want to get into a little bit more about his um identity as a socialist, mm. which is coming up, which is sort of important. Uh yeah, absolutely. I'm just thinking about the timing here. Yeah. So just to give you a vague idea of where we are, he was a committed socialist from 19 and from 1926 until 1934, he ran the, so in between the wars, mm -hmm. he ran the political cabaret at the Noshmarkt theater, the political uh, cabaret. Yes. So okay. like political sketch theater, right? And if not sketch, like political yep. theater. Yeah, yeah it's, all, get, well, it's, you know, it's all theater, right? The, everything's political. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, at that time, he would come to know Felix Slavic, who would become the future mayor of Vienna, and they became friends. Hmm. Um, let's read a little bit about this. As a child, Grun had accompanied his father to rehearsals of plays and musical comedies, letting theatrical life of Vienna soak into my bones, he said. Working in the architectural firm by day, Grun performed in Vienna's coffee houses by night. His short performances, a vaudeville mix of music, slapstick, social critique, and drama, offered something for everyone. Grun's passion for theater soon combined with his commitment to socialism, and he devoted his energies to working on Politicius Cabaret, a theater group that staged overtly political and controversial one-act skits. Nothing escaped the criticism of the Politicius Cabaret. I was in the thick of the revolutionary movement, acting and writing social commentaries for the little theaters, very anti-Hitler, anti-Dolphus, anti-clerical, grew nostalgically recalled. What do you think that means for him when the Anschluss happens? It's not going to help, I don't think. Not good. <laughs> We're going to come to it. But I had a Christmas tree as a boy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the acts were also famous for skewering the mores of the Viennese bourgeois. Most of all, the plays, as much as their staging in coffee houses, created an intense relationship between actors and audience. Grun adored this sense of the cabaret as a gathering place for the liberal Viennese community. For Grun, there existed no distinct line between educating people about socialist politics and entertaining them with jokes or songs. And he would also tread this ambiguous line in his later architectural work. Uh, Grun's identity as a socialist was much stronger than his identity as a Jew. Though he had gr grown up in a decidedly Jewish part of Vienna and nearly half his high school class had been Jewish, Grun nevertheless remember remembered receiving severe beatings by the other students because he was a Jew. Hmm. Like many of his generation, he had little use for religion. He was more committed to secular causes than religious ones. Victor was much more of a Viennese than a Jew, one architectural partner later explained. Decades later, Grun tallied and ranked his various identities throughout his life. Adorer of the female. Socialist. I love that. Adorer of the female. Socialist. Humanist. Environmentalist. Architect. Businessman. Philosopher. He's a modest guy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Jew was not among them. Hmm. However, being Jewish led Grun to socialism. The rise of socialism in Vienna was strongly connected to urban Jews, or rather Jews in Vienna were much more likely to be socialists than their Protestant neighbors. One historian of Vienna estimates that three quarters of all Viennese Jews regularly voted with the Socialist Party. Hmm. In this respect, Grun was not unique. Once again, the fellow who invented the mall, 
right <laughs> right right i interesting i'll never get yeah. over that so mm-hmm. fascinating mm-hmm. uh yeah and i think when he was in america it was sort of like a survival he was in survival mode and he, i think he also looked at america as like well this place has its own set of rules mm-hmm. this is a free for all mm-hmm. and we're trying to do or this is a wasteland a cultural wasteland and we're trying to do something anything to give them something like a cultural experience in these blighted suburbs is where right. I sort of saw it. Right. And I'm sitting yeah, there thinking about like, well, you know, hundred percent wrong, I guess. Yeah. Right? But it's not a hundred percent right either. It's no. like people have church, people have PTA meetings, people have parks, people mm-hmm. have just this idea of like trying to make America more urbane. Mm-hmm. All he ended yeah. up doing was, was making Vienna more like America. <laughs> and we're, and we're going to come to that yeah, at, yeah. toward the end. Um, his interest in socialism began while he was a teenager. At the age of 13, he joined a scout troop of budding socialists with red scarves. He remembered, I mean, this guy, when, when Hitler and his people are coming into Austria later, this guy must have just been like very high on their list. <laughs> just we're coming for you. <laughs> yeah. Victor checked a lot of boxes for the Nazis. Know, we got a sure. quick, quick hide the red scarf. Yeah. Uh, he remembered the group as increasingly political and consciously anti-monarchist. On one occasion, the troop refused to parade in front of Kaiser Karl, Austria's ruler. Grun's commitment to socialism lasted well beyond his school days. He proudly remembered himself as having been a passionate socialist up until 1938, and he and his first wife, Lizzie Cardos, were staunch comrades in the socialist movement. He would marry Lizzie in 1930. Hmm. Grun met and fell in love with Lizzie through their involvement with the theater. He had a, mm-hmm. a showmance, is what we call yeah. it. Yeah. Now, they were married in 1930, celebrating with a costume party uh, with theater friends and members of the Social Democratic Party. To uh, uplift the working class, Viennese socialists pursued concrete civil improvements, and adequate housing became the party's rallying cry. From 1919, when the socialists won citywide elections, to 1934, when the Austro-fascists seized the city government, socialists constructed housing for 20,000 residents. That was one-tenth of the city's residential property. One of Grun's early assignments from Melker and Steiner, the firm that he would go to work for, was the construction of a municipal housing project, and he soon assumed responsibility for managing the entire project because his overweight supervisor could not climb the building's stairs. Caught up in the Austro-Marxist building boom, Grun also proposed a reform-minded architectural project of his own. In 1925, Grun and two former art students, uh, friends of his, entered a competition to design one of the government's apartment buildings. The team received third prize called People's Palaces. These were apartments, uh, apartment buildings on a monumental scale. With hundreds of dwelling units for individual families, the buildings also stressed communal spaces. With kitchens, bathhouses, dining rooms, and schoolrooms, the socialist-built apartments were designed both to house people and to unite them. This was Grun's. That always works out, doesn't it? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Grun's. Uh, this was Grun's sole project for the socialist city government. The rest were commercial ventures. And it goes on to sort of explain um, that. I want to talk a little bit about. Uh, I just want to make sure I'm kind of jumping around a little bit here. He uh, in 1933 he would open his own uh, architectural firm in Vienna and they uh, specialized in remodeling shops and apartments. Okay. And that was the first phase of his career Mm -hmm. um, were these modern remodels. And he particularly did it, did the remodeling of apartments for like well-to-do Jewish friends. Uh, Uh, So in his own circle, people were like, well, I'm in this old building and it's kind of dingy. Let's update it. And they would update it. Yeah. Yeah, And I think it would mean, let's get Victor, the, the, let's get the fixture man. Yeah, he's coming yeah. <laughs> uh you know and i th- but it, you know who knows it could be a case where like we need another toilet in here or sure we need lights like we need to modernize this apartment and it's not yeah. enough just to like slap the lights up you, you know or to add you know break out a room and throw a toilet in there you've got to think about what does it look like and what's the so there's a you can see the germ of what would eventually become the mall maker uh, mm-hmm. start there. I've got some more about his work uh, in architecture from 
uh yeah from his autobiography let's see here oh yeah i've got a little bit about the uh Oh, he's talking about, this is a little bit about his join, joining the socialist group. They were called the <laughs> Vanderbund, uh, which is very funny, which was uh, a part of the socialist youth movement. And uh, at our meetings, I often gave speeches. I delivered lectures with titles such as Art and Beauty, in which I tried to prove that these expressions were not identical. The house, the apartment, and the city. The building as a molder of men and City of the Future. Those evenings inspired me to write philosophical poems, short stories and satires, many of which I would put down on paper the next night. In the poems, I tried to express my feelings about the omnipotence of nature. The satirical sketches were attacks against the even then much vaunted idea of technological progress. In America in Vienna, a short story I wrote in 1922, Vienna is nightmarishly flooded with automobiles. In this story, I predicted the construction site between the secession and the Karls plots that existed in the years 1970 to 1977. Streamline your home, science and eggplant is another prophetic story about a fully automated household. It does not have a happy ending. So he's writing Wait, like so this guy's got like dystopian ideas about how this oh, weird. He's writing okay. his own speculative fiction about the future. Yeah, and then he yeah. invents... Oh, okay. <laughs> I've got a little more from this, which is quite fun. It's going to be your fault, Groon. Yeah, Groon, you contributed to this, buddy. Yeah, yeah. I know. Like, best yeah. laid plans, man. In winter, we went skiing on simple wooden skis, and we spent the summers in camps, or as we would later say, in colonies... Uh, of 50 to 70 uh, young people living in mostly primitive conditions, usually sleeping in the barn or on a farm. Our colonies were healthy, even though I was often the cook. Ha ha. Today, one would call these camps communes. We dressed in an unorthodox casual style, let our hair grow long, hated bourgeois vices like drinking and smoking, and otherwise had much in common with the later hippie movement. Mm. The hippies we're not original at all. That's one of that's one of the theses uh, that we have here on yeah, Art of Darkness. Yeah, you constantly are seeing. Yeah, you're mm -hmm. constantly seeing their precursors for sure in previous generations. Yeah, and then he goes on to say that uh, his activities with the youth youth movement and his passions for the theater commingled. Uh, and then I want to get into a little bit. Oh, I've got a. There's a picture of Victor Groon in the political cabaret. Oh Hooray. wow! Yeah, yeah, that YouTube. that looks fun yeah yeah i mean they're doing song and dance <laughs> numbers he's a showman yeah so i got a little bit about that uh let's see here our impact went far beyond the audience scene clips and song lyrics were reproduced in magazines some of the songs such as the shoba song which criticized the police chief johan shoba became popular hits and were sung by crowds at events and demonstrations Oh, I'm sure the police chief loved that. <laughs> Our troop consisted of 25 to 30 free hey, people. Everybody out there is trying to figure out how to make political change in one direction or the other. I am not yeah. joking. Theater, theater is powerful. Even mm. now, I'm just gonna mm. little editorializing there. That it's you get a group of like, you know, attractive young people together and you start singing songs mocking somebody. Yeah. yeah, there could be yeah. some, uh, there's some energy in this. <laughs> Our troop consisted of 25 to 30 freedom loving, progressive, pacifist, and anti fascist theater enthusiasts. <laughs> and and I'm, I, I could just hear half of our audience just going cr maximum cringe. Super <laughs> pain. I'm, and I'm kind of with you a little bit. Enthusiasm was the only motive for our commitment, there was no pay. No quest for individual glory. No career aspirations. The group was a true collective. Mm. It's, it really is important to you know uh, lose all hope before we start to do theater. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Depending on our special talents, all of us had particular tasks as actors, house composers, pianists, authors, stage designers, dancers, costume designers, or manufacturers. But everyone also had to work as stage, uh, <laughs> excuse me, stage hands, ticket sellers, ushers, prop masters, scene painters, and if necessary, brawlers in skirmishes with troublemakers like the Heimatwehr gangs and the illegal but powerful and organized Nazis. Uh... And it goes on. 
Uh, mm. But that, that's the, the idea of your theater troupe having to like wail on fascists because they're coming at you. That is whatever else you say about it, whatever side you fall on, if you're on the theater kid yeah. side or if you're just like you just want to beat them up because they're theater kids, at least yeah. people are vital. They're alive. Yeah. People are. Yeah. Living. It's happening. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Life is happening and it's real and immediate. Uh, mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, yeah. I kind of like that. Um, and it goes on. Uh, at my next performance, I appeared on stage holding a market scale. I explained to the audience its relevance as decreed by the police. Whenever I made a risky political statement, I briefly presented the scale going up, implying regret that unfortunately I could not finish the sentence. They got in some trouble. Mm. This always got a laugh since everyone knew what I meant to say anyway. <laughs> Uh, yeah, very funny. When Hitler became chancellor, the terrified Austrian government prohibited the pictorial representation of all leading foreign politicians. Until this moment, Mm. it had been easy to portray Hitler on stage using a glued on mustache. Mm. The unmistakable shape provided a clear reference, but doing that was now forbidden. Fortunately, we had a man in the ensemble with a real Hitler mustache. At appropriate occasions, we asked him to simply appear on stage. At the end of one show, he was promptly arrested. Protesting that we had never intended to portray the German chancellor, we accompanied him to the police station. All attempts by the police to remove the allegedly fake facial hair were in vain, and they had to release him. It was not illegal to wear such a male ornament under one's nose. (laughs) <laughs> nevertheless it's funny that the whole thing settles on whether it's a real mustache or not like right, you, you can have a real hitler mustache not a fake yeah one. you just have a mustache and then cut it to a hitler mustache for the night and then yeah okay okay uh a little more here because this is so interesting in early 1934 pressure from the austro-fascist dictatorship shut down the political cabaret and the red players this was not the end of my theatrical activities however i wrote a non-political folk song cycle ugh, that was successfully performed in the major halls of the suburbs it was comic and retold the old story of a tyrannical guardian who tried to thwart the marriage of his pretty ward the guardian was equipped with all the bad qualities of a reactionary petit bourgeois and the young man who courted the beautiful ward possessed all the virtues of an upright young worker. Oh, it just sounds terrible. At the climax <laughs> of the show, the, just uh, uh, just this polemical, yeah. At the climax of the show, the lovers sang a duet to the tune of the famous song Das Glück ist ein Vogel, whose refrain, refrain chimes, in the end, you do what's forbidden anyway. Hmm. Uh I think das Glück ist ein Vogel. It means something like the luck is like a bird. Mm. Luck is like a bird. I don't know. The censors, uh, it's Vogel, uh, V-O-G-E-R-L. I might have to look it up. The censors had no complaints against the text, but a politically sensitive audience usually realized the deeper meaning, namely the call for resistance against any dictatorship and burst into tumultuous applause. So he's out here uh, doing this theater. And then he's also having, he's, you know, he got an education. Uh, you know, he really struggled. I mean, he got beat up in high school at times and, but then he kind of found his way, you know, on the path to become, um, an architect. He he opens his own firm and I've got a, uh, a few readings from him about his, uh, his work in architecture. And this is sort of general, uh, but I want to read it. Architecture in general was a strange story in the interwar periods in Austria. Outside the public works of the city government, hardly any new buildings were erected. Hundreds of talented architects dealt with the adaptations and redecoration of worn down homes that were then taken over by new owners. Many designed furnishings and utensils as employees of the Wiener Werkstatt. The field of work was surprisingly wide. Many young people who laid special emphasis on home decor, whose tastes could not be satisfied by ready-made objects, would hire architects to decorate single rooms or even entire homes. They spent proportionally more than what is spent on this today, which is understandable when one considers that the current temptations are cars, TVs, audio, and home appliances, and travel. In the 30s, these temptations hardly existed. So people are allocating a lot more of their budget to fixing up single rooms or whole homes when they take over these like old musty dusty viennese i assume townhomes and and various yeah. apartments and lofts and things makes sense yeah between 1920 and 1938 a viennese interior style emerged 
but after the Anschluss, both architects and clients disappeared. Some architects continued working after immigration to various uh, other countries. It goes on. My own work as an architect began slowly with small projects. Often it was just one bedroom or a small council flat. A council flat is public housing. One of my first assignments was the conversion of a horse barn in the 10th district to a low budget but attractively furnished school for rhythmic dance for Carla Shushinsky, now Carla, uh, Carla Zaner of Paris. He converted a, uh, that's kind of fun, converted a horse barn into a dance studio. I like this. He's really kind of out there hustling. He's freelancing. Yeah. He's, he's still sort of entertainment adjacent. Right? Sure. We'll, have, well, and he's, well, Victor's he started, an architect too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he's not he just this, uh, Yeah. He started this thing when he was in his late 20s too. So, right. He's a young, he's a youngish man when he kind of starts this hanging up, hanging up his own shingle, as they call mm-hmm. it. Uh, yeah. It's pretty cool. Another job was to set up a room for the couple Friedrich and Hedda show Schau in one of the few houses that was built by the famous architect Adolf Luce in Vienna. This work was particularly important for me for two reasons. It gave me the opportunity to explore the nature of the architecture of Luce, and it gave me access to the intellectual and political circles around the Schau family. The fees from such projects were small, but they were sufficient to improve my income. After my marriage to Lizzie Cardas in 1930, I was able to renovate our alcove, which I changed exclusively for us. By cleverly exploiting the space, I transformed it into a com- com- it's a tough word, combinative living, sleeping, dining, and study area, and I was able to set up my drawing table. The built-in furniture was painted in green and white with a lacquered finish and was ex- accented by natural colored oak. I had sp- uh, specially designed the beds, tables, chairs, and lighting fixtures according to our taste and had them manufactured by skilled craftsmen who were then abundant. This four-purpose room was the ideal solution to the housing problems of the times. It was even depicted in the illustrated weekly magazine, Der Kuckuck, the Cuckoo. From among the magazine's admiring readers, I found clients for new projects, one of which was the conversion of that large villa to five single homes that I mentioned earlier as a reason for leaving my employment. So Mm. he he redoes his own uh, alcove in such a way to make it super multi-purpose Ikea. You could could do everything. You could sleep here. You can eat here. Right, 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 right. You can do craft brewing. You could do architecture here. And then (laughs) it it gets uh, featured in a magazine, and that gets him a bunch of new clients. Yeah, because... Interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, he's he's certainly he's an interesting guy at this point, right? He's very mm-hmm. clearly intelligent, clearly um, knows how to make things happen in his social network, capable. Um, yeah, inter- interesting dude at this point. Mm. Yeah, I'm glad you think so. I mean, I, I like I, him at this yeah. point. I like him. He oh, you seems, like him? I'm all right with him. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So far, so far, you know, he's a hustler, which I appreciate. Mm-hmm. He's got, you know, he, he's recovered from this catastrophe that occurred to his family right and his is finding his way much respect mm. to that that would be something very easy to just kind of uh you know spiral for the rest of your life on so yeah much respect yeah. to victor grun in 1930 in ish it's a little frustrating to me because when i do my uh outline sort of darkness i do kind of like to lean on the wikipedia for the spine of of bios and that's easy to do for somebody like marlon brando who has Mm. this just this huge wikipedia right for for victor grun we're literally into there's one paragraph about his birth all the way through to his thing in the political cabaret then there's one paragraph for his career and then it goes on to the the anschluss in 1938 that's right. all that's there. There's right. nothing about any of his wives. Like it's a really for somebody this important. It's a mm-hmm. su- and I know I am not going to ever go and become a Wikipedia editor. No, right. I'm too right. busy with uh, with doing the podcast yeah. and all the rest of it. But yeah, it's a bit frustrating because it's like well, there could be a hell of a lot more in this biography. Uh, yeah, there's there's I mean he's clearly got a lot going on. Well, it's one of these things is we don't. There's all kinds of people. I was throwing some of these people out on the Twitter account leading up to this just like the people who made the suburbs what they are right through different decisions that they made and and uh you know some of them yeah have, the guy who basically designed the first freeway system has a uh has a very similar wikipedia page it's 150 words or something 
<laughs> and he designed the first, you know, he designed the first like interchanges in Southern California, which then inspired the entire, he's why America looks the way it looks. And he's got like a page. Yeah. Yeah. It's just bonkers. Mm -hmm. That is the end of the first section of this, <laughs> which is uh, kind of his childhood up until mm -hmm. the Anschluss and their escape. And now I'm going to get into that. And I'm I'm eyeballing the time. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't I don't know if we're going to go Crowley length here, but I'll I'll do my best to <laughs> to get this in in a a decent amount of time. Yeah. On March twelfth of nineteen thirty eight. Austria invited Hitler across the border. Viennese fascists joined Germany with enthusiasm. Fascists also turned on Viennese Jews with vehemence. Jews were forced to scrub Vienna, uh, Vienna's streets, sidewalks, and buildings. Many Jewish leaders were immediately rounded up and sent to the concentration camp at Dachau. Suicides in Vienna increased as many Jews saw little hope for the future and took their own lives rather than face humiliation and torture at the fascist hands. And worth noting too here, this is mixed. This is all mixed up. What did that? What did we just say? What it was it? Seventy five percent of of Jews lean social democratic or or to the socialist party. Yeah. So it's both a combination of political uh, enmity, but also. Ethnic, also ethnic ethnic right. hatred it's all mixed up with that with it right and resentments a lot of resentments that have been bubbling for for generations i'm sure on both yeah. sides yeah on both sides exactly yeah yeah um yeah one wonders what what groom's life would have looked like if the other side had won world war one but just strange man yeah. <clears throat> groom like many viennese jews was caught unprepared and he he talks about this they were like this is never going to happen they were going to stand up and fight. And then yeah. literally Austria just opened the skirt. Right. It was just like, here you go. Yep. Oh, yeah. We've got a bunch of those guys in here. You can have them. Yep. Yeah. A, ne right. a next me, baby. Right. Like Ugh. nut. Yeah. Wild. And we'll hear his own words about this a little bit. He later told how the fascists immediately confiscated his car, seized his firm, and briefly jailed him. Dude was on a list. Yeah, for sure. Big time. Yeah. When he was released, he went immediately into hiding at his mother-in-law's house. Grun, ever the optimist and perhaps unwilling to believe that his beloved native city could turn against him, waited longer to leave Austria than was wise. Hmm. After Germany annexed Austria, Grun set about destroying evidence of his connection with the Social Democratic Party. He spent a long night feeding the stove with some of his plays, writings, and books, later declaring, my past goes up in flames. As his past turned to ashes, Grun also worried about his present safety and possible future. Soon after Hitler's troops marched into Vienna, Grun, Lizzie, and their theater friends gathered together. Over a late night dinner, the group pledged that if they managed to escape from Vienna, they would reunite and perform their plays again. To preserve their material, the group typed up multiple copies of their skits. Ah, we have to save the skits. Then they mailed the plays between pages... Uh, of fascist newspapers to sympathetic theater friends in Paris, London, and New York. Uh, after making this pact with their friends, Victor and Lizzie worked to save themselves. Lizzie sought to secure the couple a permit to leave Austria. This was a legally simple, albeit expensive and emotionally difficult process. For the Gruns, as for many European Jews, the more difficult issue was finding a country to accept them. One month after Germany's invasion, the Gruns had a lead. Ruth York, a New Yorker, was working to find the desperate couple an American sponsor. You'd had to have a sponsor. Sure. Grun had met York on a train from Paris to Vienna five years earlier. The two had become close friends while York lived in Vienna and pursued an acting career. York even hired the young ar architect to design her Viennese flat. After York returned to New York, the friends maintained a lively correspondence. All the while, York anxiously urged Grun to leave Vienna. In late April, she found the Groons an American sponsor, Harry Lowry of New York City. Lowry immediately provided assurance of financial support to the American consul in Vienna. In a letter to Lowry, the consul assured him that the Groons will be shown every possible assistance and that their case will be sympathetically considered when they call. It was not easy to smuggle stuff out. Yeah, the, I'm sure. The Nazis, the, the Germans were not, the authorities were mm -hmm. not, you weren't able to take a bunch of money out of the country simply right right yeah. right uh i think he would later say he came to new york with next to no english and eight dollars in his pocket yeah 
At the beginning of the next month, Germany granted the Gruens permission to emigrate to America. They paid a hefty tax to leave their native land and were now bankrupt. Hmm. Lost it all twice. Gruen yes. lost it all twice. And he's, you know, what is he? He's 30 in his 30s. Uh, yeah, I'd be what yeah. 35 at this point. 35, right? yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty real, man. Those wars, they come up again and again and again and again. And uh yeah. just so heavy. Yeah. Well, his book, his uh ego- egography, uh his his autobiography begins with this. Uh and I'm gonna read just some different passages because it's such an interesting time. And then, of course, on the after dark for Patreon, patreon.com slash art of dark pod, we are going to talk about uh, the time which occurs around here when they when they become refugees, when they meet, when he meets Einstein, which is quite fun. And then we'll also Mm -hmm. talk about how his friend uh, got their luggage by dressing up as a stormtrooper. So a little a little extra. (laughs) Well, yeah. That's a rune effect for you for the Patreon like subscribers. Please support the pod. We yeah. really appreciate it, and we, we want to. The do. goal this year is 333 patrons. We want half mm-hmm. a crow. A crow. Half a Crowley. That'd Help nice. us out, folks. We're mm-hmm. getting it done. All mm-hmm. right. So this is Victor. The Great Fire, March 11. The fire burns and blazes from 11 p.m. until the early morning hours of the, of the following day. I feed the flames and stare into the fire while I cower in front of our wood-burning stove. A passel of documents offered up as a sacrifice are spread out in a semicircle around me. My wife Lizzie digs into boxes and drawers, searching for new sacrificial material. The 20-year record of a political past is bursting into flames. I am burning everything that could be combustible in the near future. Actually, it would have been incriminating material four years ago already. But in that Mm. era of Austro-fascism known as dictatorship tempered by sloppiness, we thought we could afford the risk. The notes, manuscripts, programs, photographs, newspaper articles, and stage and costume designs consumed by the flames are documents from the political cabaret. From 1926 to 34, I directed this group. I also supported it as an enthusiastic author, lecturer, actor, and singer. Every issue of our magazine, the political stage... The appeals and manifestation uh, manifestos for the never again war movement of the early 20s, all those writings against Austrofascism and Nazism penned since 1934 fall victim to the flames. I burn political speeches and articles for magazines and associations, political books and pamphlets, the names, addresses, and telephone numbers of all my friends and acquaintances. But for all my haste, I also carefully set aside things that may be useful in the future. I keep my school reports, my charter as a journeyman bricklayer, a certificate from the master builder, my enrollment certificate from the Academy of Fine Arts Vienna, photographs of my architectural work, and articles about my professional activities published in national and international journals, as well as about 50 letters of appreciation from clients. I sort through my numerous blue school notebooks filled with poems, aphorisms, and satirical sketches, mostly written on lonely nights when I was between 20 and 25. I put these in a shoebox. The fact that a large portion of them will reappear on my 70th birthday in a book called Meine Alte Schuhschachtel is not yet fathomable. Mm. So they got this together and published it for him. I keep the manuscripts of some small theater pieces, but hide them in editions of the Nazi newspaper, The People's Observer, to send on to a friend in Zurich. At last, the bonfire is over. The fire burns out. The floor is swept. The room is smoky. My eyes burn. I need air. I open the window wide and look outside. It is dawn. The view has been the same for the last 30 years, and it is completely unchanged this morning. There is our tobacco shop, our convenience store, our mailbox, our cafe. There is also our security guard. He pulls a red armband with a swastika on a white circular background out of his coat pocket and puts it on purposefully. The first day of the millennial empire has begun. (laughs) Oof. (laughs) Yeah. Wow. So let's see here. This is called a Viennese snack. This is interesting. He's talking about this period here. Our mood is cheerful and optimistic. We are expecting a change in the political landscape. 
Through secret conversations that have been going on for weeks, we feel justified in our hope that a re relaxation of the dictatorship, a reauthorization of the Social Democratic Party, which was banned since 1934, and a restoration of democratic freedoms are all imminent. A general amnesty for political prisoners has already been declared on February 15th. Our gathering is a reunion with friends who have been imprisoned for their underground work. They tell us ab uh, uh, about their interrogations, and we learn that we have all been spied upon. Oof. In yeah. the last coming attractions, people, in the last <laughs> few days on the streets and in the public squares and on the hiking trails in the Vienna woods, we have all come across adolescents wearing socialist insignia, waving flags and singing songs of liberation. In two days, on Sunday, March 13th, the referendum will decide whether the continued independence of Austria is desirable. We are convinced that this question will be answered with a resounding yes. A new mm -hmm. spring of political freedom will replace four years of, of oppression by a reactionary regime. From time to time, as we nibble on cold cuts, cheese, and pastries, and drink coffee, fruit juice, and wine, we turn on the radio to hear the latest news. Lizzie tries hard to keep the food and drink flowing. The radio tells us repeatedly that Chancellor Kurt Schauschnig will make an important announcement soon. Impatiently, we wait for his patriotic appeal to Austrians to stand together, to forget all our differences, to vote for a free Austria, and if necessary, to fight for it. Finally, at 7.25 p.m., the voice of Dr. Schauschnig comes out of the loudspeakers. The speech is as short as it is devastating. He says... The federal president, Miklas, has asked me to inform the Austrian people that we are yielding to force, because even in this serious hour, we are not disposed to spill German blood. We have ordered that in the event of an invasion, our armed forces are to offer no significant opposition, no resistance, but instead to withdraw and to await the decisions made in the next few hours. So in this hour, I take my leave of the Austrian people with the German word and my heart's desire God protect Austria. Ooh. Oh man, that's got to be hard to hear, right? That Coming group of people, radio waves. Yeah. too. Oh. Yeah, and uh, across town, there's some guy going, "Yes, rock and roll, right. let's right. go." But right. like these right. people are the, it's not good. It's really, really bad for them. Yeah, yeah. And if they Jeez. really believed, as he indicates, that it was going to go the other direction, it must feel like. You ever had the pit fall out of the bottom of oh your yeah stomach? yeah no it yeah. must have just been absolutely just disorienting i mean the closest thing i could think about would maybe be 9 11 or mm -hmm. the covid moment like living in new york city and this thing is starting yeah. to happen and you're slowly just going nah that no nah, this is another fault right. when no oh right. god yeah yeah <laughs> here yeah, we yeah, go exactly. yeah yeah Oof. wild well let's go we are struck by lightning there is silence for several minutes, then a flood of questions. What should we do? Be patient and wait? Go underground? Should we flee abroad? And if so, where? I briefly confer with Lizzie. The naive illusion that Austria can resist our big neighbor is destroyed at last. The Germans will invade Austria, and there will be war all across Europe. No country on this continent will be safe. Of this, we are convinced. But how far away is far enough? Australia, China, Canada, the US? We put all our hope in America. We want to go to America as fast as possible. I immediately write two letters. The first is to my mother's brother, Herbert uh, Levy, who has lived in America since 1914 and now calls himself Harry Lowry. The second is to the only other person we know in America, a New York actress named Ruth York. In both letters, I beg them to send an affidavit as soon as possible. A few minutes later, I rush out to the street and put the letters in the mailbox in front of our house. I am afraid that the censorship of letters will begin within the next few days. It is only then that I am able to worry about my friends. I tell them of our plans. They all want to do the same thing, but they say that the German language is the basis of their existence. For you, it is easy, they say. You are an architect. You can get a job without language skills. But for us writers and actors, we, don't ha uh, we won't have a chance in a foreign language. In this emotionally charged moment, I get carried away. I make a promise that I have no idea how I'll keep. Without knowing if and how we can get ourselves to America or how we will survive there, I proclaim, if we are able to reach New York, I will form a Viennese theater group and we can do cabaret again. Let's try to smuggle our manuscripts abroad. Everybody is given the address of Ruth York, but nobody really believes my words. 
Our joyous Viennese party has become a tragedy. We sadly say goodbye to each other and no one knows when or if we will ever meet again. Oh my God. Jeez. It's like a movie. It is. It really is. Wow, a biopic that's... about Victor Grun would be a banger if it was it done would properly. Be. I mean, be amazing. so far up to this point so far. Yeah, it would be, it would be pretty, it would be pretty great. Huh? Oh yeah. And that moment, all your friends are breaking up. Like that's hard, man. Yeah. And I love this. We'll do, we'll do theater again in New York city when we're all, when we're all there. Yeah. yeah. And let's yeah. send the manuscripts to my friend. History theater in Minnesota. I near. I might pitch them. I I talked with them about like a Victor Grun type drama as a because yeah. it's got a, the Minnesota connection. But it's such a big sweeping story. Anyway, this would be a great right. subject to tackle dramatically. Well, anyway, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I've got more uh, from this period because it's so interesting. Ninety days in the Third Reich. The Nazification that had transformed the German Empire gradually over a period of 10 years captured the city of Vienna almost overnight in a climate of mass his- mass hysteria. Dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. Right. <laughs> the explosion that erupted in the city included outbursts of enthusiasm and atrocities, especially against Jews, but also against the clergy and supporters of the Patriotic Front and against communists and socialist officials. This intensity had never been seen in the Old Reich, and it surprised even our liberators, the German troops who were transported to Austria. It was a surprise to the bureaucrats as well, who arrived in droves to ensure a proper takeover of the newly annexed Ostmark, which is was what Austria was now called. Mm. However, when uh, excuse me. However, only part of the population responded with such enthusiasm. The vast majority of Austrians were either overwhelmed by the events or resigned to them. Many thought, as bad as, as it is, it cannot get any worse. They acknowledged everything grudg- grudgingly or timidly. The mixture uh, of enthusiasm, indifference, powerlessness, and fear may be explained historically. Since 1918, Austria has been had been a state that nobody wanted. As a remnant of the great Austro-Hungarian Empire, it was considered an economic failure. The idea of an Anschluss to the Reich was as old as the Republic itself. In November 1918, with the consent of all parties, the Republic of German Austria had been declared part of the German Empire. But with the Treaty of St. Germain, the victors of World War I, Britain, France, and the U.S., <coughs> oh, excuse me insisted that the Republic of Austria become an independent state. Born from this pressure, the minor state was shaken by continual economic crises and mass unemployment, particularly of young people. There was constant strife between political parties, which led to civil war-like symptoms, corruption, and banking scandals. So it's a case Hmm. where they they wanted to be part of the German, of greater Germany, even before but the the winning powers, the Allied powers of World War One, okay. didn't allow it. Right, 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 yeah. right. So, huh. yeah, there it is. Uh, so they were occupied by Hitler and the Nazis. Hmm. Okay, it's got a little bit about the Jews in Vienna. Uh, let's see here. Similarly, the Jews living in Vienna had moved to the capital from all parts of the monarchy at various times. He's talking about how cosmopolitan Vienna was. Uh, There were Czechs, Slovenes, Poles, Ruthenians, Croats, Serbs, Italians, Romanians, Hungarians lived alongside a German-speaking Swabian, Alemannic, and Bavarian Austrian population. Hmm. Uh, So, I mean, it was just... Uh, just this, this, that was, he's talking about the Austro-Hungarian empire and yeah, Vienna it's, it's as sort a of city. That. It's a city of the world, right? I mean, yeah, yeah indeed. Very... Yeah. So he goes on. Similarly, the Jews living in Vienna had moved to the capital from all parts of the monarchy at various times. They retained certain characteristics from their original cultures or lost them over generations as they assimilated into everyday Viennese life, which is what it sounds like happened to, um, to Victor Grun. Uh, Jews were not fully granted uh, civil rights until 1867. Politically, the Viennese Jewish community was just as fragmented as the rest of the population, with the bourgeoisie and wealthy Jews voting for the conservative Christian Social Party, while the intellectuals and those who were less well-off supported the Social Democratic Party. 
As in earlier eras, the Jews of Vienna had limited professional options. It was extremely rare for Jews to find work in agriculture or forestry, so, uh, in many types of crafts or in the civil service. However, the number of those working in independent professions as doctors, lawyers, journalists, writers, musicians, and merchants in the city was relatively large. In high schools, Jews made up 40% of the population. At the university, it was 30%. Artists and writers of the interwar period included many famous Jewish uh, personalities. Hmm. The Nazi battle cry, uh, Jews out, enjoyed great popularity for purely pragmatic reasons. This is, I found to be a very interesting point. The Aryanization of business made it possible for those who could provide Aryan identification cards to gain and enrich themselves. Others who owed money to Jewish merchants, doctors, and lawyers found themselves suddenly freed from those debts and could breathe a sigh of relief. Also, in terms of competition for scarce jobs, an entire minority group was suddenly disqualified. So anti-Semitism was a popular prejudice and the new rulers took advantage to the fullest extent. Mm, right. Very right. interesting. It's not just about, Ooh, these, these Jews, we don't like them. It's like, well, if we, if we go with the existing, uh, power, yeah. all of these folks can't, uh, press us for anything we owe them right. and get kicked out of the professions, which right. opens room for, for opens ourselves for us. and right. for us. Yeah. 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 So very interesting. I think I, somewhere on some level, I knew that, but I had never sort of put it in the, in those uh, words. And, and yeah. And that, and that makes sense that there's always going to be multivariate reasons. Right. And you might have this power that's, that's, you know, and it's a little easier to just other a whole group rather than to make some sophisticated argument about, you know, <laughs> some, it's easier to hide it behind these sort of primal emotions than, than yeah. try to come up with some policy or something yeah and nothing nothing like that happens today does it no Brad? yeah no no we're so much farther along <laughs> i've got a, a little interesting anecdote about his car during this period in vienna due to my very successful architectural practice i own a car a steyr mm. 50 the direct forerunner of the volkswagen mm. In these days, I use it for urgent trips. One day, I am stopped by a menacing gang of youths in uniform. Oh, those youths. Yeah. I am asked to get out of my car, uh, and it's commandeered for the party. I timidly ask for a receipt, and the boys burst with laughter. Yes, they say, that is possible if I accompany them to the barracks. <laughs> I reject this dangerous offer. I'd rather go home on foot. Yeah. What yeah. follows is tragicomic. In the next few weeks, a polite policeman appears from time to time to notify me of traffic violations. When mm. I tell him that my car has been commandeered, he does not believe it. He says, <laughs> such a thing is illegal and therefore impossible. I see my car frequently because there are not many cars in Vienna. At first, it is, <laughs> it is apparently used by high-ranking German officers with drivers. Then one day, my, to my utter amazement, I see my old socialist friend Fritz Janel behind the wheel. Again, it is only later in America that I learn the facts. Since he was regarded as an Aryan of, middle, of military age, my friend Janel was not allowed to leave the country. The National Socialist Party esteemed his services as a graphic designer and exhibition specialist. Eventually, he was sent to Switzerland for a job. From there, he went to Paris, where his Jewish girlfriend, uh, Judith Spindle, was waiting. They married and immigrated to New York. We saw each other there many times until he died of multiple sclerosis. Thereafter, mm. we enjoyed... Uh, uh, hang on. Thereafter, we enjoyed a most beautiful friendship with his widow and her second husband, Richard Kafka, who had also managed to escape from Vienna. So... <clears throat> I don't okay. know if his Kafka is related. I doubt that it's related to the the Prague Kafka, but in any case, yeah, interesting. This is I love this. Book. I love this image of like they confiscate his car, but there's so few of them that it's like going by every day. That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that he could take that just kind of like, well, they took my just car. Roll with it, right? Just right, roll right. With it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really funny. This is called on the bus. Another day, while I'm on a bus, of course, because his car was stolen. Mm -hmm. A uniformed man bumps into me. Pardon, I say politely. He yells at me, Wir Deutschen sagen Entschuldigung, which means we Germans say, excuse me, forgive me. On an impulse, I stammer, je suis Francais. He becomes excessively polite and says, pardon, ich habe 
ja net gewusst, dass sie dem fremden Zwecke suchen. suchen. Pardon me, I didn't know you were part of the tourism business. <laughs> <laughs> so you would I, apparently in in Vienna you would say pardon, mm -hmm. and not Entschuldigung, which mm -hmm. is a little 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 rougher than mm -hmm. pardon. It's, it sure. takes a, it's got a few more syllables. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's quite fun. <laughs> uh, so I've got another little anecdote, and then we'll move on to him actually getting out. Despite all my cautions, I am stopped one day and arrested by two Sturmtruppe. I am marched a, stort, a short distance to the Liebenberg Monument near the university, where I find about a hundred others who have already been detained. The line of captives standing two by two doubles within the next two hours. Everyone knows this is the end. From here, we will probably be taken to barracks and from there to a concentration camp. Mm -hmm. Rescue seems impossible. Suddenly, a man in uniform jumps up on a platform and in pure Viennese dialect says, you have a mazel. We already have too many Jews for today. You can go home. The man has no idea that the word mazel is Yiddish. But as prisoners, we now know the true meaning of the word. It's an incredible stroke of luck. Without this mazel, I would never have written these lines. Got lucky. Wait, what's, wait, what's a mazel? A mazel is like a good act, isn't it? Like mazel tov. Mm, okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, Interesting. A, a, a mitzvah is a good act, but a okay. mazel tov well, means congratulations, yeah, Ma doesn't it? Okay. Yeah. I think it may be mean like, I mean, mazel tov means good luck or something. I don't know what yeah. mazel so, means. So yeah. he's basically, he, they, they're they in the process of getting rounded up and it's basically like, yeah, we're full today. Mm. Yeah. That's <laughs> right. Interesting. Wow. Woo, doggy. Uh, so we will tell those fun stories on the after dark. Uh, mm -hmm. We've got, let's see here. Ah, this is a little bit about when Hitler marches into Vienna. This is March 14th, 1938. I use this day to visit the construction site of a ladies and men's fashion store on Maria Hilferstrasse as it lies directly on the military entry route of the Fuhrer. Secretly, I am eager to see the parade. The building site is surrounded by wooden planks. There are 12 plasterers, or Gipsler, as they're called in Vienna, working on an ornamental plaster ceiling located on the inner part of the scaffolding. As the Heil cries keep coming closer, Heil! I turn to the workers and say, gentlemen, if you want to see the march of your Fuhrer, I will give you some time off. Nobody accepts the invitation. They hmm. work on the scaffolding with more enthusiasm than ever before. In light of this spontaneous refusal, I am also forced to stay behind at the site and miss the historic spectacle. I mean, when he wanted to go see Hitler march into Vienna, I suppose you might. Yeah. Yeah. So then there's more about them getting uh, prepared to, to go to the United, the United States. Uh, and this happens. Finally, I pick up travel tickets for Lizzie and me at the American Express office for a plane from Vienna to Zurich, a train from Zurich via Paris to London, and finally a ship to New York, economy class on the Stottenham. While waiting in line for my tickets, I am called on the telephone. Surprised that someone knows where I am, I take the handset and hear the excited voice of the young actress, Illa Raudnitz. Breathlessly, she says, stay where you are. I'll be right there. Your apartment has been occupied by the Gestapo. After 10 minutes, she arrives at the American Express office. She recounts her experience. She had wanted to visit us, and when she buzzed, Gestapo men opened our apartment door. As an Aryan, she was able to question these people openly. She found out that they wanted to take me to jail because one of my suppliers with an old German name of Bogate had pressed charges against me for not paying a small bill. In these, So the flip side of that debt thing, we yeah. can just get these guys. Right. In these final moments, it seemed my luck had run out. Helpless and desperate, I stand there, my tickets in hand. Then, recovering from my initial shock, I call Bogate's workshop to clarify this apparent misunderstanding, but I only get the supervisor on the phone. He is completely shocked because he knows that I own nothing to this shop. He offers to iron out the matter with Gestapo headquarters. I thank him for his good intentions, but I am also convinced that a meeting will not help. Everyone knows that if the, the Gestapo decide to intervene, no power on earth will stop them. The only thing I can do is warn my wife, who is visiting her mother, not to go home under any circumstances. I beg my mother-in-law, who is an Aryan, to hide us 
As a convinced anti-fascist, she is immediately prepared to do this, although she risks her life. Later, we also managed to arrange for her immigration to America. So now they're hiding out. And uh, Mm. this is where the anecdote will come in the after dark, but uh, I will leave that for now. Uh, They, after this, uh, they do manage to, to get on the flight and get on Swiss uh, soil. Mm -hmm. And there he's talking about how panicked they are the entire time. Cause it's like, what if they they have to have like an emergency landing in, and they're still in German territory or something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Anything could go wrong at any time. And you you know, who knows who's waiting for you where? Yeah. Yep. And then he says, uh, once they're in the Schweiz, he says the transformation from an oppressive dictatorship in Vienna to the free atmosphere in Switzerland is tangible, visible, and audible on the ride from the airport into the city. We passed cheering people celebrating the victory of the Swiss football team against Germany. The sight of the white cross on a red background instead of the swastika is bliss Hmm. in the seven weeks before our boat trip from England to America. We say goodbye to Europe and to the many friends who have fled Austria before us. This parting is very important to me. I can't shake the feeling that because the annexation of Austria turned out to be so easy, the appetite of the megalomaniac Philistine from Braunau will grow, leading to a devastating war. As much as possible, I want to enjoy the European culture and lifestyle and store it all up because I assume I will find little of it in the new world. Boy, is he right. (laughs) We visit museums and participate in what I will later in my writing call urbanity. I want to meet for one last time all the loved ones I may never see again so that I can remember these people forever. We experience something new on the farewell journey through Zurich, Paris, and London. We live off the generosity of friends. We don't spend a penny of the 20 Reichsmarks we've taken with us. In Zurich, we are guests of the generous actress Matilda Daniger like so many other refugees from Hitler's Reich. Uh, and it goes on. Mm-hmm. It talks about the people who host them. And uh, and then they finally get on the big steamer, Stottendam. And he says it's a dreamlike experience. For seven days, they escape harsh reality. And they move farther away from their pain in Europe mm-hmm. and closer to the uncertainty of a new land. Hmm. And so now our friend Victor Grun is a refugee, but he's in America, baby. You can, if you can <laughs> make it here, you can make it anywhere here, kid. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to be all right. Yeah. You're going to yeah. invent the mall and leave right. a very troubled <laughs> legacy behind that people okay. still can't quite figure out. <laughs> Here's him saying, On the last night of the cruise, we are so excited that we cannot sleep. We go to the ship's bow and stare at the first lights of America. I then separate myself from the group. During these hours of unexpected, or excuse me, of expectant tension, I return to images of the past. And then he talks about his past uh, Mm -hmm. as as a child. And that brings Victor Grun to the United States of America, New York City, circa 1938. 